Hey everyone, six months ago, we purchased this GE Profile 2-in-1 washer-dryer combo. Documenting everything from the moment it was offloaded from the truck, its installation, configuration, operation, inspection. We ran all sorts of tests. We made measurements of temperature, measurements of power consumption, and evaluated how the device functioned and found that the weakest point was this filter right here because we felt as though things were getting through. Not a lot, mind you, but it seems like over time, these little pieces of lint that make it through to the heat pump are gonna start building up like we saw here. And eventually, this was gonna become problematic and reduce the efficiency until the point that sensors were gonna start tripping, repairs were gonna start needing to be made. So what we decided to do was to follow the cleaning regimen, bought this extra brush and vacuum cleaner hose, cleaned everything out to the best of our ability. And I said we will come back in about six months and see how everything looked if we maintain this as good as anybody could. Especially since we got pets and looking at the filter, we could see hair just creeping over the perimeter of the filter. And a long-term prognosis for this says that an investigation should be made. Let's do that now. So we're gonna tear down, inspect, clean, and reassemble the heat pump on this GE washer Let's get started. First order of business is to unplug the power plug from mains, and we're gonna wait a while to ensure all capacitors inside have had a proper chance to drain. A reminder that there are high voltages present and a possible warranty violation. If you follow along, you do so at your own risk. I've then moved my machine off of the wall because I'm gonna need space on all sides to be able to do this job. Next, I shut off both the hot and cold water supplies going to the machine and my machine will be close enough to the wall that I could safely leave these two hoses connected. I'll be using the following tools and supplies for today's task. A flathead screwdriver, a pair of channel locks, a pair of pliers, a pair of needle nose pliers, a pair of side cutters, cable ties, Phillips screwdriver, larger masking tape, and a Sharpie. If you like this content, please hit the like button down below. It helps me a lot when you do. This panel will be the first piece removed, working not to damage it in any way. I start with the removal of the fabric softener reservoir, opening, pushing down on the tab, and then removing the entire unit, putting this off to the side. I then remove the detergent reservoir, pushing down on that tab at the end to remove that, being careful because both of these may be filled with liquid. Opportunities to clean up any dirt found is always taken so it doesn't get pushed into the machine. In my experience, I would not recommend an electric driver for this project. I'll demonstrate the first screw removals with the electric driver. It's going to be these four. They're all Phillips. There's a fifth one down here, different from the rest. Throughout this project, some screws are going into plastic and some are going into metal. And if you pull the trigger too quick, you could kick the screw even though it's magnetized. And there's a high risk of it falling into the machine, which would be very difficult to remove. So it is just my recommendation that you use a regular screwdriver for this job as it could get a bit tricky with an electric screwdriver. The remainder of this video will be with my magnetized Phillips screwdriver. And magnetized is not an option or the screws will fall into the machine. Some of the areas are simply not going to be unscrewed without lifting the screw with a screwdriver. The screw I'm removing now is an entirely different thread than the other four, as we'll see when I remove it. And this is the machine thread, and I will demonstrate how we're going to order screws for this project. If you order them, assembly will be real easy. And if you do not order them, you have absolutely no chance. So I'm using a thick piece of masking tape, and I'm going to wrap all these screws into that masking tape and seal it. And then I'm going to label this with my marker as one through five as our first step, being the first five screws. Put it in my bin and move on. I'll pull the filter now, pressing that tab down to remove it completely. And this gets a general cleaning more than recommended because we clean it after every use. So we can see this is what it looks like with the general cleaning. And I'll put this off to the side. So this panel right here is held captive over here by two pins that have to come out to the right. So I could pull this side out first. And I'm going to do that now, pulling forward and up to release it. And now what I want to do is lift upward to release that top captive screw. And it's like a little snap. And then the bottom one, I push to the right to release that too. And now that panel is removed. It's not elegant, but I mean, it works. That's how they designed it. 
we're left with what looks like a whole lot of connections, but it's really not that bad. A couple of cable ties need to be removed and a couple of those connectors on the main board and that's it. And if you start to look and see which ones are going up to the machine, you get an idea of what needs to be removed. Each is keyed differently so they don't go in the wrong location, it has its own type of snap or button for removal. So you really have to take a look at each one to see how they get pressed in to pull out. Make sure that connector is disengaged before you pull up. You do not want to damage the connector or the wires. This one I pulled away on the tab to release it. This one has a tab on the opposite side I have to press down to release. This one has a tab on the opposite side. And the one on the end has a pull tab facing me. Again, not all the connectors need to be removed. And I might have removed one more than I actually needed to, which would have been evident had I actually clipped the cable ties first. So I'll clip the cable ties that are necessary for this board removal, as we see here. Ultimately, all these cable ties on the machine will be removed, but I'm going to remove the ones that are bound to this harness. But not all the cable ties on the front cover have to be removed. Make sure when cutting the cable ties not to cut into the wires or you'll be making unnecessary repairs. The red and black wire has a connector going to the machine and we're going to be removing it from the machine's connector, not on the circuit board. So right over here, I'll remove that connector now. This might look complicated to some, but it's just a couple of connectors and a couple of cable ties that'll go right back on as they were found when the project is reassembled. Finally, we have one more cable and that goes to a sensor through the machine which we will gently pull out from its rubber fitting by the connector with needle nose pliers, comes out just like that, no problem at all. The front panel is now disconnected, we can put it off to the side. Next step is the removal of the top cover. There are seven screws, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This will be the one different screw of the bunch. All these screws are added to the tape, fold it up. Then it was marked 6 through 13 because I can't count today, but I changed it back to 6 through 12. The cover is then pulled forward and then up and then back. And then the back is lifted up. Some limitations with the camera here, but we can see what I'm doing. Lifting up and then off the machine. I was pleasantly surprised to find the technical documents for this machine taped inside the machine. I did not know where it was. This now paints a picture for the schematics for my diagnostic video that I posted about this. Top right corner will take you to that video if you're interested in looking at it. But I'm going to put this to the side because we're not dealing with this now, but I'll come back to it later. Because now I need to remove this shield and that starts with the removal of this hose right here. With a large pair of pliers, I compress this hose clamp bringing it into an optimal position, then raising it up the hose off the barbed fitting. I don't have any of these cable ties with fur clips that come with the machine. I don't really need them though. My first attempt on this was to simply stick a screwdriver in to allow the cable tie to be unloosened and therefore reused, but you could damage that ratchet that's in there doing that. I found that none of this was necessary anyway, as we'll come to find in a bit. I place a towel down here just in case water comes out when I remove this hose and using a flathead screwdriver at the base, which I rotate as I pull up gently on the hose, allowing for the hose to be lifted off of the barb fitting, which we can't see because my hand's in the way. The hose is removed and no water came out in this scenario, so that's fine. So the trick for these is to simply cut the cable tie at the base and then pull the cable tie through and then reuse the fixture as a holder for a new cable tie. With that, I'll cut the other cable tie from this front panel. Notice the red tape where the cable ties are on these cable harnesses will make it easier to reassemble later. Cables and hose now disconnected. We can remove this cover by removing these screws. One, two, three, four, five, and six. The cover is then lifted off, negotiating the cables and the hoses through so nothing gets caught. And this will be set 13 through 18. Now this support bracket will be removed. Behind the top left side of the bracket are two cable ties that need to be snipped in order to release a cable running down the side of it. 
Each side of the bracket has two screws that need to be removed. One is up here on top. And the other one is front facing. Same thing is done on the other side. And the bracket is lifted straight up and off. Maybe a little wiggling is required to loosen it. And this will be 19 through 22. Next will be the removal of this blue reservoir where the detergent and the fabric softener go. Kind of floats here. But first we want to add a towel inside both of them because there may be a lot of water in here just to be safe. I'll clip this cable tie off to the left side. And then gently lifting on this hook, I remove the connector from the back of the hook and then disconnect it by pushing down on that tab. I've laid down pieces of masking tape so I can mark these hoses one through four. I'll just put it on the top of the cover here. And I've added tape to hoses three and four, making one and two self-evident since one has a bend and the other one is straight. I'll then work a towel down under these hoses so no water leaks into the machine when I remove them. And using the pliers one by one, I compress the hose clamp just enough that I can rotate it into a good working position. Once I do, I lower the hose clamp so it is away from the barb fitting so that the hose can be removed. Then I put tape on all four clamps so they don't inadvertently slide down into the machine. Again, using the flathead screwdriver for leverage, the four hoses are removed. This last hose on the side needs to be removed from the molded plastic one area at a time. And then this wraps around under and over a few times, being careful not to damage the hose. It's still connected on the bottom. We'll be removing that shortly. We can see how pushing back allows this unit to slide up and out of this locking mechanism. So pushing back and then up and then deflecting the bracket with the hand ever so slightly releases it from that bracket allowing the whole unit to be lifted up, exposing the large hose on the front beneath. The clamp was too big for my pliers, so I used channel locks to squeeze the clamp and pull the clamp and hose off at the same time. Now I'm able to rotate that whole unit, exposing that bottom hose from before. I bring back that hose clamp and remove that hose. Removing that hose from the last piece of molding, this piece can now be put off to the side. I take just a moment to wipe down any water that has spilled with the removal of that blue piece, which now brings us to the cover of the heat pump. We have just a little bit of work to do before we can remove it. We're going to need to unmount but not remove this inverter to access some screws. First, we're gonna need some slack and we can actually push these cable tie mounts out through the plastic gently by compressing them and pushing forward like so. Also two cable ties along the side of the inverter that we're gonna clip right over here. One up top right over here. This is now disconnected. This is now loose. We'll remove these cables from the molding here to give us even more slack. Tracing one along the side here, we're gonna push through. And this inverter actually slides to the left for removal, but there is one screw that holds it into position. We'll remove that now. This will be labeled as 23. We see the track right here. As I slide it to the left, push forward, it releases, and we'll let it lay down like this. We now have access to our two screws. One more cable tie to unmount. And these cables no longer impede the cover. As we see, there's enough slack for the cover to clear. The top cover will need to be disconnected from the blower shroud. There are two screws here and here to be removed. The fan now has a little bit of give. These screws will be 24 and 25. This sensor will come off with the cover and doesn't need to be removed. There are a total of 15 screws that secure the top cover of the heat pump to its assembly. Two of the screws immediately around the filter housing will be long, odd screws, different from the other ones around the perimeter. We're gonna remove those two screws first. Here's one of those screws. And the other one. 
at which point we'll now remove the remaining 13 and I cannot stress enough the importance of the magnetic screwdriver. As you can see, the screwdriver is lifting the screws up out of the hard to reach areas like here, as well as here. And here would be impossible without a magnetic screwdriver, as well as here. If it falls in the machine, you're gonna be in trouble. These screws will actually get a container since there's so many of them. And it's gonna be labeled 26 to 40. Ready to lift the cover now. These cables will be removed with it. We have to make sure that these cables in the rear are clear. Pulling the fan away to clear it, making sure the rear cables are clear. I pull off on the front cover slightly and absolutely making sure that everything's clear and I don't damage any of the elements inside. I slowly lift up that cover and then from the rear I lift it up. When I'm confident that I could clear everything, I'll then raise it off of the unit. Taking my time so I don't damage anything and pulling it away from everything. Our first look under the hood and as we slowly make our way back towards where we would see our filter would be, you could see the area that we were able to maintain. There's almost a line there where our brush was able to get in and keep this area somewhat clean at regular intervals, except for in the rear over there where the brush couldn't get in. And right over here on the intake, we take a look and see just forward the intake is collecting and then what would be the top of the cover, it's collected. I had no idea about any of this because I couldn't see that far to the left. Turning on the light, we see that inside the actual drum, everything is clean, but on all those junctions where it's coupled together by that rubber hose, we see buildup around that hose. Over here, there's buildup on the left, as I had said, but here where the filter meets, all sorts of lint is collecting here, and it's evident on these coils, a lot of dust is getting through, as if the rear portion of the filter in particular is not making a good seal, even though it's fully seated. It seems to be worse on the top of this rear section than the bottom, though we see a lot of dirt and debris around here. Then these fins have a coat of dust on them, and problem areas that we've historically seen we can see how bad that dust is impacting those areas. Areas which I regularly clean with the brush almost every time. The bottom portion of the filter is clearly allowing hair and larger debris to get through as we see here, along with the dust that we're seeing everywhere else. As we make our way back through the fins, through to the other section of fins, we could see that the dust is less and gets finer and finer but still there on these fins as I do a close up. What we're not seeing at this point is any large dirt or debris, really just the really fine dust. And as we would work our way back towards the end, this dust would become less and less, almost non-existent by the last coils. Nonetheless, fine dust is making its way through this entire circuit and building up over time. The filter is not adequately filtering this dust out. It's worth noting that some fins did arrive bent from the factory, nothing terrible, but we will be repairing this after we do a cleaning. This will increase, at least in part, some of the efficiency, allowing for some better airflow through the fins. Now documented, I get to remove this big chunk, which comes right out. Very cool, but very sad at the same time, given that there's no way to be able to handle this during normal operation. Next is a general cleaning, vacuuming, as well as the removal of that lint with a mild detergent if necessary, making sure not to drop any down into the hole. This also includes getting that back area. I found it really compacted in that back corner, tried using a brush with it, even some spray cleaner to help clean that corner out. And finally, the removal of lint from inside that pipe. Everything on the input side is now cleaned up and looking new, except for the cover, obviously, which I'll deal with later. This back corner now cleaned out. We could see nothing on that hose in the pipe. I didn't let anything drop in there as well. And the seals are also cleaned up on the perimeter. The blower side was perfectly clean and didn't require any cleaning on my part. I'll remove this towel from the back and fold it up. I'm going to drop it in the hole just so nothing falls in for the next cleaning steps. 
For those who are going to ask, I'm just going to point out the canned air does absolutely nothing for the removal of dust from any of these fins. A vacuum cleaner with good suction and a brush does well to remove a lot of that dust and dirt from the first layer of fins only, though that has a lot of the dirt on it. The best would be a nozzle from a pressure regulated air compressor, but I also found a leaf blower can be effective as well, as long as you don't touch any of those elements and always blow from the right to left. This will blow a good portion of dirt and dust out of the system, but it won't get everything. I elected to use a spray bottle with demineralized water that's not distilled water, but demineralized water to spray down the elements to release the dust. Now this spray bottle itself was not optimal. I would have rather used a pressurized spray bottle with more pressure. It would have done a better job at removing the dust or at least made it easier to do so. Because the water is demineralized, it reduces the chance of scale forming on any of the metal parts. However, if you use distilled water, there is a very good chance that it could react with the metal or any of the coating and surfaces. I would just avoid using distilled water in these applications. The water will wash away the small particles of dust that form on the fins. Gravity carrying that dirty water to the bottom of the pan where the dirty water could be wiped away with a towel. The leaf blower is then used to blow away any excess water from the fins. It obviously won't collect all the moisture, but we'll get a lot of it and we'll let it just sit out in the open for a few minutes to dry. We'll conduct a visual inspection and it is still wet. So there are water droplets throughout, but we could see a dramatic improvement in these fins. All of the dust has been removed. There's probably some dust residue that still remains, but predominant amount has been removed as we see here looking at the before and after. Had I used a pressurized spray bottle, I probably could have done a slightly better job, but I'm still very happy with the results. So I'm gonna call this good enough for a standard cleaning. And that removal with the water made it through all levels of the heat pump. As it continues to dry, I take this time to carefully repair all the damaged fins that I see. They're very delicate and only require a light touch to straighten out. They don't have to be perfect, they just need not be bent. This is an easy way to improve performance and stops dust from collecting in these areas. With the fins now completed and as the device dries, I'll make my way over to the top cover where I'll conduct a basic cleaning here, removing the lint, just staying away from that sensor down there. A little bit of spray is also used to help clean some of this up. And after wiping down the perimeter, this is now ready for installation. We'll begin reassembly with the installation of the cover, remembering to remove that towel first, and ensuring that this rubber seal is clean and undamaged all the way around. Starting in the back to make sure that long edge of the cover goes under those cables without damaging anything and making sure that we don't hit any of the fins. The cover slides into position. Matching up the two holes where the pipes go through in the back, the cover is then lowered, making sure everything stays aligned. The blower is pulled out of the way so it could drop all the way down and it is secured. A quick check is done around the perimeter to make sure the cover is seated properly against the mating surface and nothing is stuck or in the way. Then we'll use screws 26 through 40 and install these two separate special screws last, going around the perimeter and turning the screws in three quarters of the way, but not tightened down until all the screws are in, at which point the special screws will be turned in and then all of them will be revisited and snugged down. Now the two long screws up front by the filter will be installed and snugged down. Screws 24 and 25 will be used to connect the blower motor back to the top cover, installing both before they're completely tightened down, tightening down the second one and then redressing the first one. The inverter will now be locked back into place. There are three locks. followed by a locking screw, number 23, which we'll install now. I've purchased the same size cable ties that were used in the machine. The ones by the inverter, I'm gonna pre-bend for an easier installation to go around these loops and secure this cable into place. This will be the first of the cable tie installations. I wanna make sure that I match up that red tape before I tighten it down. 
Also looking at the old cable tie markings, I put a cable tie on top as well and snip off the ends. Then I'll place these wires back through the molding as I had found them and push these fur clips back through. Same for the other fur clip as well as the other cable. Finally, one more clip down here and the cables on the heat pump look exactly like it did when it left the factory. Move these cables out of the way and we'll begin to install the detergent reservoir, which looks like it doesn't require any cleaning. It's in good condition, so it'll go right in. I don't see any problems. This starts with the installation of the small hose on the rear, then pressed into the molding, followed by the hose clamp, which must come far enough to clear the bob on the plastic fitting. The large hose has a notch over here and it lines up with this notch over here. So I get the hose into position, lining up the notch and seating it fully. Then using the channel locks, I carefully secure the clamp into position, making sure that that notch remains aligned, though I can turn the hose slightly by applying a little bit of pressure after the fact on the channel locks. The whole blue container can then be lowered into position. And with a slight deflection of the metal tab outward, the back blue piece can be dropped into position and pulled forward, locking it into position. This hose that now run along the side can be carefully installed back through the molding. The hose mark 4 can be pushed back in the 4 position, followed by the hose mark 3, and then 1 and 2 are obvious because of its shape. After which all four hose clamps are reinstalled on the end of the hoses. Now the electrical connector is reinstalled and pushed through the molding, after which the cable is secured with a cable tie. The dispenser is completed. We'll now install the support bracket, noting these cable tie holders will be on the left rear side. It should lock it into position as we push it down on the frame. And we'll secure it with screws 19 through 22, three quarters of the way until all of them are in. Then with the fourth one in, they get tightened all the way down. Two cable ties then secure that cable along the frame. The frame is completed. The outer shield is now installed. Negotiating the hose and cables through its set in position, ensuring that it is behind that blue pipe down here on the bottom. And then pressed in position. Again, making sure the cables are out of the way. Screws 13 through 18 will be installed to secure this into position about three quarters of the way. At which point all the screws will be gently torqued down. The front shield is installed. We'll now dress in this hose and the associated cables. The hose is pressed back onto the bob fitting. Two loosely fit cable ties are reattached around the hose. The hose clamp is brought down into position and secured over the bob fitting. More cable ties are replaced on the cover. And everything here is now secure. This entire reassembly looks factory. We'll now install the top cover. Guide pins on each side of the unit line up the cover, bringing it forward into position, locks it into place, making sure that the front overlaps the front face of the unit. It is then secured with seven screws found around the front of the cover, which we've labeled six through 12. This one will be the one special screw installed. Again, installing everything just about three quarters of the way to line everything up. And once everything is in, they'll all be snugged down. With the top cover secured, we'll now install the front control panel, placing it on this ledge to work. The first item will be the installation of the sensor, which will be gently pressed in to its rubber fitting to full seat, followed by the connection of this red and black connector. Then all of the connectors will go back into the board where they will remove from slightly off camera, but they're all keyed to an individual slot. 
after which two cable ties on this front panel will be replaced to hold those wires together. It's always a good idea to take pictures before disassembly for moments like these. And now we'll pay close attention to the locking tabs on this right hand side that fit into these corresponding locking screws. I'll lift the cover up into position and then we'll look at this from the side to have a better view. The cover is brought to the right and then rotated upward from the left side to allow the bottom lock to go in, pressed in followed by the top lock. It now needs to be secured on the left side with screws. Our last batch, one through five. The odd screw will go here, followed by the four other screws here. The internals are held up in a position to line up the first screw hole. The screws are then turned in about three quarters of the way and I go all around in a circle. We could see it pulling in the device as I turn them to full seat and snug everything down. Fully assembled, we'll now install the dispensers. Here's the detergent and fabric softener and the filter. Hot and cold water is then turned back on and the machine is moved back into operating position. Everything is complete, so we'll plug in power. Conducting a quick electronics test, I provide power and kind of funny, the first thing that happens is we get a filter notification. I thought it amusing, so I left it in the video. At this point, I'm going to shut down the machine and run some diagnostics and make sure everything's okay. I sped this test up in this video, but the main focus of the diagnostics that I was doing was the heat pump. Everything operating very nice. The numbers were good. No strange noises, nothing like that. The results of all of the tests that I did show no errors, so we're ready to run some laundry through the machine and bring it back to normal service. The tape method kept all the screws in order and made this job real simple to do. I was very much surprised at what I had found after six months of utilization. I definitely think that after a year we could expect problems with a machine like this unless it was maintained in the way that I had shown with the opening of the heat pump and the cleaning out of that area on the left side of all this debris. Eventually there'd be enough clogging that efficiency would be reduced and failure would be inevitable. There are filters that people are making that help mitigate this. Maybe we could talk about that in another video. But that concludes this video on the disassembly, inspection, cleaning, and reassembly of the heat pump on this GE 2-in-1 Profile Washer Dryer. I hope you found this video enjoyable, entertaining, and informative. Do me a favor, hit that like button down below. Helps me out a lot when you do. And hit that subscribe button to be informed of more videos like this when they come out. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply? <laughs>